doctor in environmental science from the Autonomous University of Barcelona and has 20 years experience in the field of LCA. He has been an academic researcher in several Spanish universities, in the University of Surrey, in the UK, and he also worked in the UK for the multinational consumer goods company Unilever. He is currently a consultant with the Danish firm Two Zero LCA Consultant. The floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Manuel. So I'm going to give you an overview of the work we have done in Hincon in terms of environmentally assessing this technology. And everything we have done is related some, in some way or another to the concept of life cycle and life cycle assessment, or LCA for short. Uh, so maybe not everyone in this room is familiar with this concept and tools. So I'm going to very shortly introduce it. And what we try to do with life cycle thinking is to take a, a more hol a kind of holistic or more comprehensive approach to environmental issues. Uh, and how to em environmentally assess human activities. Now you can see in this diagram here what we mean by life cycle for, for, a, for a given product. And in this case, we have um, a washing machine detergent. So the life cycle for this product starts uh, extracting the natural resources that we need, such as oils um, to produce surfactants. And then we need to transport these raw materials to a factory. We need to package the product, send it to uh, retailers, and then the consumer will use it in a washing machine using energy and water. And then in the end, we have some waste that we have to dispose. So we try to, at each of these stages, um, we try to see what is happening in, in, in all these uh, human controlled activities. What we try to do is to quantify the use of natural resources and pollution created. Um, to the atmosphere, to water and soil. And we put this information in a, se in a set of environmental impact indicators that we can easily interpret. So life cycle assessment is this process of evaluating um, this system um, in terms of inputs, outputs, and potential environmental impacts. Now in this presentation, I'm going to focus only on emissions of greenhouse gases associated to this uh, to, to the technology we are assessing. So the main question we were trying to answer in Hincon in, in our work package was, is Hincon any better from an environmental point of view than traditional construction? So if we want to make any of these really um, uh, interesting uh, construction elements we have seen in the pictures, is it fr better from an environmental point of view to, to print them than to make them as we have done so um, traditionally. Uh, in order to answer this question, we have taken a practical case study. So we chose one of the elements that have been designed during the project. In, and uh, the, the case study we have taken is this, this pillar that was designed by, by X3, one of the partners in, in the project. And you can see a simulation here, and the, the, the shape of this pillar in the, in the picture. So it would be like four meters tall and it's, it's wider at the bottom and it has a volume of around 600 liters. Now the thing is because it's quite a big uh, construction element, the strategy to produce it with the Hincon machine would be to break it down into different pieces because uh, so that each piece is, uh, does not exceed the capacity of, of the concrete that the machine can handle. So the idea would be to print uh, each of these four pieces hollow, so only the outer structure, and then we would transport these this outer um, shells, empty shells, to the construction site, which we assume here as an example that, uh, that the customer is at a distance of 100 kilometers. And then at the construction site, these four pieces are assembled, reinforced, and casted with concrete to fill them. So. Uh, what is the life cycle uh, for, for uh, this pillar? So, well, if you want to 3D print a pillar, first of all, you need the 3D printer. And of course, in the <coughs> life cycle assessment, we are taking into account the manufacturing, the production of all the elements, all the machinery that is needed to produce a 3D printed element. So in the study, we are taking into account the production of the different um, components of the machine, the cable robot, the extruder, 
all the subtractive elements. Um, also, the building itself, the workshop where the uh, where the machine is housed, is placed, and is used as a as a as a factory. On top of this, obviously, we need electricity to run the machine and the, the concrete itself to print. Then we have the transport step. And finally, we have the casting and the assembly of the pillar in consuming some uh, reinforcing steel and some concrete also to, 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 fill, to fill in the, the pieces. Finally, some, we have some waste that needs to be disposed of. Um, it can be some concrete dust from polishing or some losses during the casting, but also the machine itself. So at the end of its useful life, we will have to do something with all this uh, machinery will have to be dismantled and some of it will be recycled other parts might be sent to a landfill so all of this is taken into account in the study and then we need to compare this with a traditionally equivalent um, i mean a traditionally produced um, pillar that is equivalent in shape and, and in looks so here what we consider is that we can produce the same pillar with a tailor-made uh, disposable plastic mold, such as the ones that are uh, offered by this Spanish company, Valero, so you can um, produce these molds for, your, for the shapes that you want. Um, <coughs> and then we would just cast the pillar. Here you have an example in the picture for a, in this case, for a, um, a square, for a square pillar. And then this mold is discarded. So it becomes waste. For this case, the, the diagram is much simpler. So you, we, we need the concrete, we need the mold and the reinforcing steel we cast. And then we just need to dispose of the mold. And also if you have some concrete uh, losses during the, the casting, you have also to send them to the landfill or to recycle them. So I will take you through the results. Um, as I said, I'm only going to talk about green emissions of greenhouse gases. And so the unit of analysis here is producing one pillar. And the, in order to produce one pillar, the emissions that we have quantified would be 650 kilograms of carbon dioxide <coughs> equivalent. And in the graph, what you can see is how different activities in the, um, in the production of the pillar, the 3D printed pillar, how different activities are contributing to those six, 650 kilograms. So first of all, I think it's very interesting to see that the 3D printing activity, that's the, the, the part of the life cycle, life cycle that has to do with using the Hincon machine has a very, very small uh, part of the impact. Only around two kilos of these 650 kilograms of CO2 are coming from operating the machine and the, the amortization of the machine and its operation. So it's a very small part of the total impact. And as you can see, most of the impact is related to the supply chain of producing concrete or producing reinforcing steel. That's where most of the emissions happen. But it is important here to uh, consider that the transport of the piece, the printed piece to the construction site, to the customer, is quite important. And here we took a uh, distance of 100 kilometers, but you can imagine that if we have a higher distance, the, the impact is also going to be higher. So this is something uh, to take into consideration. It's not, uh, it's not negligible. Then if we compare uh, the two approaches, uh, 3D printing versus the traditional approach, um, this is what you have here. So you see that the, the Hincon pillar, again, makes 650 kilograms of CO2 while the traditional approach with a disposable mold would be a, a little more. Um, in both cases, we have more or less the same impact coming from the production of the concrete and the production of the reinforcing steel, but we have more impact in the traditional approach due to the production of the mold um, than in the 3D printing scenario where most of the impact is related to the transport. Because as we, as we have seen, the printing itself does not add much much environmental impact. So we are in for this particular pillar for this particular case study we are saving between 20 to 25 percent of the greenhouse gases. Then we did an, an additional analysis because um, in currently in order to put this kind of pillar in the market 
it has to be reinforced and casted uh, in order to meet uh, the current construction standards. Uh, but our partners suggest that the printed, the hollow structures might be structurally uh, stable for many applications. And as we have seen in the previous uh, presentation, this is quite a strong uh, material. So we kind of think outside of the box and, and, and with LCA we can see what would be the environmental benefit if we were able to skip the casting and the reinforcing of this structure, if we were able to put uh, in the market this kind of hollow structures. And this is what we see here in the third column. You can see that the environmental impact of such a structure would be much, much lower um, because we are saving a lot of material. Um, so we think that where the, the, the most of the environmental benefit of, of the Hincon technology would be in being able to make this kind of hollow structures that save a lot of material and therefore the impact of producing all this material. So to wrap up, we've seen that uh, in terms of the Hincon technology, printing as such uh, has a little environmental impact compared to the other activities involved. Most of the impact is in the materials you use, in the supply chain, the production of the different materials, the concrete and the steel, if you need to reinforce. But for the Hincon um, technology, the transport of the finished pieces could be, uh, could be an issue. It depends, of course, on the distance. And when comparing with the traditional approach, we can see that there's a benefit in, in, in the um, in the 3D printing approach, when we are comparing with, when, when the alternative is using a disposable mold, is, there is indeed a benefit. But as, as we've seen, the most, most of the potential in terms of environmental impact lies in being able to produce these kind of hollow structures that allow us to save material, whenever feasible, of course. And that is all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention.